Good morning, everybody. Appreciate everyone being here this morning. I'd like to invite you to open up to Genesis chapter 1. We'll be there shortly. That'll kind of be our North Star, so to speak, for this morning. This is the class made in his image. We're going to be discussing over the next couple weeks reflecting the characteristics or the character of God. And how we kind of want to run this class, uh, Nate and I, is it's going to be, it better not be lecture-led. I mean, I'm not going to lecture up here. Uh, we have to really focus in on uh, being engaged in this class because I think that's how we'll get more out of it than me just standing up here talking to you. Let's talk about this idea of identity. That's a buzzword for today. People wondering what their identity is. What is your true identity? People may be asking, who should I be? What is my purpose? And I suspect that all of us in this room have asked those questions uh, at some time in our lives. And I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with asking those questions. I think it's actually a healthy thing to kind of do some introspection and figure out who you are. But we must be careful where we find those answers. Where are some places that we can go that would probably be a wrong area to help identify ourselves? Oprah. Oprah, yes. Identifying yourself on Oprah is probably not a good idea. Absolutely. Where else? Social media, yeah. Uh, you, go, you go to Instagram. Does everybody show the mess in the rooms uh, on Instagram? No. I mean, it looks perfect. It looks pristine. I mean, there, there's no toys on the ground. Uh, there's no plates. There, all the dishes are done. I mean, it looks really nice. And, it, and if you do a really good job, you put the you know, hashtag no filter. No, you, you've really made it look good by what you put on there. Yeah. What else? What else identifies us? Our jobs. Our jobs. Yeah, and, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right, Mr. Ross? That's not a bad thing that, that we identify with what we, our careers or, or what we like to do. Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can identify there, but what if it becomes our main identifier? Yeah, absolutely. If, if we don't control ourselves, that can certainly blend into who we identify with. What else? Yeah, our family. We, we may uh, just see through the lens of who we are uh, with our family members, and then we may make some bad decisions because of that. Absolutely. I think some other places that we may look at is even within ourselves. We may see past mistakes. We may see flaws, sins. We mentioned family, work, hobbies. Some of these things are not bad things. Some of these things are good for us to take inventory on. But if that is our identifier, our true identity is in our flaws or is in our sins or is in our past or even just focusing in on me, like, I'm the best thing in the world. That's a problem. And our world kind of helps make this and kind of, kind of fuels this in our psyche with some considerations. We may ask ourselves, you know, what's best for me? What makes me happy? These are common questions that people may ask. Uh, with this idea of individualism. We, we talk about in America this rugged individualism. That can be something that is not necessarily a good thing. Or this idea that we make decisions on how we feel. Uh, you see this in the idea 
of our bodies are led by how we feel. This is an old, old, ancient doctrine of Gnosticism. But this fuels the fire for people to say, you know what? A man can identify as a woman. Even if they have male chromosomes in the body of a man, they can still identify as a woman. Because feelings trump what is true reality or what's within our bodies. Or this idea that you can't tell me what to do. There's no absolute truth. That's great for you, but it's not necessarily good for me, this idea of relativism. These may be some foundational thinking that we may have, our, our base coat in how we see ourselves or how we identify ourselves. And you and I both know using these ideas, these misguided answers are leading our world into a crisis. That might be understating it, actually. Without God, without recognizing how he fashioned us as human beings from the beginning, we live in this world with an identity crisis. We're trying to figure out who we are, and we're looking in the wrong places. But thankfully, God has provided us a path to understand who we truly are. So this morning, I want to talk to you about what it means to be made in the image of God. This is the very first thing that Scripture says about human beings, is that we are made in the image of God. Have you really considered and meditated on that concept? I mean, that is a gigantic concept that kind of permeates through the rest of Scripture. And I'll admit, you know, with my familiarity with Genesis 1, you kind of read over that and you kind of lose the full weight of that statement. Have you ever stopped and considered what it means to be created, to be made in the image of God after his likeness? Understanding this biblical truth will help us unearth our true identity. And, you know, there are certainly some questions that reside along this idea, this concept of being created in the image of God. But this biblical truth is not some incomprehensible mystery. It's not some kind of thing that we can't figure out what this truly means. And the enemy's pervasive mission on humanity is to create this identity crisis. And this class hopefully will identify our true identity and it rests in our creator and his son Jesus Christ. Hopefully by the end of this class... We'll understand some of these concepts. Since we are created in the image of God, we are called to reflect the character of God and bear his image to the world. Seeing God more accurately helps us to see ourselves more accurately. God's will in our lives is for us to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. And finally, the real application to this class, how should the knowledge of, that God is fill in the blank? change the way I live. So hopefully we can gain some understanding through this class. Our objective today is to understand the meaning of image, understand uh, man's purpose, uh, look at the defaced image of God and see the restoration of that image of God. The image of God begins in Genesis 1. In the retelling of the creation story, for five days we hear God say, let there be, and whatever he decides to declare is made by his powerful words. Light and dark, land, sea, skies, they're all placed in his creation according to their kind. And he speaks them into existence. Everything is placed in an order in Genesis chapter 1. Everything has a purpose in Genesis chapter 1. And then on the sixth day of creation, he breaks from speaking things into existence in his creation to making. The pinnacle of creation is found with mankind. Let's read Genesis chapter 1, 
verses 26 through 31. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with, its, with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Skip to chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So do you see how the narrative kind of shifts from this idea of let there be? You see this repetition throughout Genesis chapter 1 where it talks about where he says, let there be, let there be, let there be. I'm going to create it after its own kind, after its own likeness, after its own kind. Let there be. For five days this happens. Then what happens in, in the, on the sixth day? There's a shift in the narrative, very subtle, where he says, let us make. There's a distinct difference between speaking something into existence. Obviously, we can't understand that because we're human beings. But there's a distinct difference between speaking something into existence and making something. It becomes personal. What kind is man created after? Because you see that throughout creation, he's making things after their own kinds, after their own likeness. What is man created after? The likeness of God. There's not like another set of human beings that he makes them after. He's made after God. It becomes personal. God created humankind and stamped us with his mark. And this is the high point of creation. His creative brilliance reaches the pinnacle on day six of his creation. It's almost as if he kind of steps back and looks at his completed creation and sees everything that he's made. And he's kind of nodding and he's like, yep, it's really good. That's what was lacking in my creation. I needed somebody to bear my image. And Genesis paints this picture of a God who, like an artist, kind of finishes his masterpiece. There's nothing else left to do, and I'm going to call it very good. Not just good, but very good. And it's all because of of the created man that he's made. In chapter 2 and verse 7, it gives us insight on God's creative process. What does the text say he does? In chapter 2 and verse 7. Yeah, he formed man. He breathes life into that formed man. And that life-giving spirit, that breath that he puts in his mouth, Brings life into this man. It's almost as if uh, the one writer says, God gets his hands in the soil and intimately forms man from the dirt. The word form conveys the idea of an artistic, inventive action that requires skill and planning. It refers to an artist pouring out his ingenuity into an intricate work of art. 
Have you ever considered God as an artist? I mean, I hope you have. Even, not even looking at man, but, but looking even in the rest of his creation. I mean, you, you see a sunrise, you're like, oh man, there's no way I can duplicate this if I'm going to paint this. But especially human beings. You definitely see the master craftsman in human beings. Am I right, Ryan? You see that in your little baby. See that in so many ways in our, in our human nature. Have you thought about God being a sculptor, forming a rock into a masterpiece, or a potter, forming that clay into a vessel? And he shows off his greatest design, his best ingenuity with form and function in harmony at the creation of mankind. Why are we the high point of his creation? Why is his creation considered not good, but very good? With the part of the creation that's most reflective of his essence. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean by essence? The things that make God unique mm -hmm. and that make him special and worthy of, of worship and adoration. Yeah, absolutely. Most mirrored in our existence. Absolutely, yep. Any other thoughts or comments? I've been talking a lot. Yes, sir. So I was more along with the soul that is in the finger to it for eternity. Yeah, there's, there's more parts to us that in comparison to the animal kingdom. Yeah, absolutely, John. But the fact that he breathed life into us is truly incredible. There's, there has to be a God that can do this. There's no other possibility than that. The fact that he's given us life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh huh. Any other comment? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was thinking of your comment about the art and everything. One of the hardest things to change for us is people. Yeah. Because yeah. people, you have to capture something about the person, like almost a personality. It's not like drawing a tree. Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Angie's absolutely correct. Uh, artists, at their best, they have to create this picture of a person. I mean, if you do a bad job with somebody's family uh, as a painting, oh, I mean, it looks bad. I mean, can you imagine Aaron Gay painting a picture like of stick people? They're like, well, here you go. It's going to cost $5,000. I mean, it is tough. Ah, to do that, absolutely. Yes, ma'am, Marguerite. Uh, also, you know, like you always said, that he doesn't have dominion over the air, that he has the power of creation, you know? Yeah. Say the Lord came and son. We don't have that kind of power, but we have, you know, we can have some strong power. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second, the idea of this dominion. Yes, sir, Mr. Erkin. Yeah, that's a, certainly a big part of, of our image as we're image bearers. Absolutely. Um, let's go to this idea of the meaning of image. What does it mean that mankind was created in God's image? And to kind of help us understand this question, I think it's helpful to kind of look at this word image as it was used in the Old Testament. You see in Numbers chapter 33 and verse 52, it says, You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places. What is the word image used to describe in this verse? Idols, yeah. A false god, a false Canaanite god, yeah. And, and there's other passages that suggest very similar uh, I guess, uh, language in 2 Kings and Ezekiel and Amos. If we lived in the ancient world and our neighbors had a household, uh, they had an idol sitting on their mantle, they would tell you know, us that their little statue that they had in their house literally was not their God because their God resided where? 
It resided in the temple. It resided in, in, their, in their community. It resided, you know, the temple of Ra or Moloch or, or Dagon. Instead, they would tell you that this little statue was a representation of a god that they worshipped. Um, I have, I have a, an idol here, okay? Bobblehead doll, uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. Settle down, John. Settle down, Brandon. Um, it looks just like him. I mean, it has his jersey. He's number 13. Uh, he has his sunglasses. This is very typical of Ronald Cooney Jr. He just hit a home run. He usually did that past year. He's got the yellow cleats on. He's got the yellow armbands on. I mean, this is Ronald Acuna Jr. It actually says it right here. Ronald Acuna Jr. What if I told John Whitaker today, I was like, hey, you wouldn't believe it. Ronald Acuna Jr. is here. He's here at West End. What? Okay, cool. Let me go meet him. And I, and he goes, well, he's not. Where, where's he at? I said, well, he's sitting right next to me. Here he is right here. John would be like, Matt, you're ridiculous. This isn't truly Ronald Acuna Jr., right? No. No. It's not. But it's a representation of him. It's not actually him. And just like the, the idols that point to the gods, this is actually just pointing to Ronald Acuna Jr. Let's take it even further. This idea of image comes from uh, the word icon, which is a, a Septuagint in the Greek, uh, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This word image is icon. Of course, we see our familiar word icon from that. What do you recognize when you see that? Oh, it's just a check mark. Oh, it's just, you know, a black check mark. That's all, that's all it is. No, what is that? Nike. You, you know, it, even with the uh, metamorphosis of their logo here, of their icon here, they first had to write Nike because nobody really knew what Nike was. But gradually as time went by, I mean, you just know it by the check mark. How about this one? Oh, well, that's, that's a half-eaten apple. You know, it's, a, 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 it's actually a Macintosh apple. Looks just like one. No, we all know what that is. I mean, everybody, doesn't everybody have an iPhone? Sorry, Android people. How about this one? Brandon, what is that? It's a Braves logo. It's a Braves logo. Yeah, well, so, somebody could say, well, it's just a, a cursive A. You know, it's a red A. Who does that represent? Atlanta Braves, Braves country. Represents a whole group of fans. How about this one? Well, it's another red cursive A. This one's a little harder. It actually only goes on an Arkansas Razorback baseball hat. Specifically baseball. Not any other sport. But you can kind of see a resemblance there. How about this one? Oh boy. Oh boy. Alabama. Alabama. Uh, you would not believe how many times I wear that middle one and they go roll tie or, or go Braves. They get them confused. But you see that this logo or this icon points to something it represents. And so when God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, the meaning is that God is making a creature similar to himself. And similarly, you see this in the passage in Genesis 5, verse 3, where it says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Now, we know that Seth wasn't identical to Adam, but he was like him in many ways, as a son is like his father. Uh, raise your hand if you have a mini-me in your family. I do. I do. Poor Jackson. He doesn't know. Oh, man. 
I see so much of myself in him. When I went home for, for Christmas break, uh, the teacher said, I was happy to have your son in the class. It was really nice to have your mini-me. I go, oh, boy, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean, everybody's kind of got a mini-me in their, in their family. Um, not as miniature as some, like Nate and Jim. I mean, there's definitely mini-me's there. But we all have similarities. The same can be said about us and God. Humans are not identical to God. Let me repeat that. Humans are not identical to God. But they're made to be like God. Likeness and image informed the original readers that man was like God and would in many ways represent God. So Genesis 1.26 simply would have meant to the original readers, let us make man to be like us and to represent us. So you see this idea of image being reflection and representation. Any comments or questions off that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a really, I hadn't really thought about that. Any other comments? I forgot, Jimmy, you're a Braves fan. He's actually got a Braves jacket over here. Awesome. Yes, sir. Hey, so on Cordes' point there, too, when we start thinking about image, um, and you go back to the example of the painting, right? When you capture a painting or you capture a photo, it's, it's really answering the what of yeah. what that is, the image is. When you see a photo, you cannot retain, you can't see who. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about in this class. Yeah. We're talking about really defining and understanding when we talk about the image of God, who you are that represents that versus yeah. what. Yeah, yeah, great, great point. The, the who and what questions are, are very important. All right, uh, let's move on to the next uh, section here. Uh, the idea of man's purpose. Now that we understand what it means to be made in the image of God and that our purpose is to represent and to reflect God. So representing God. As we mentioned in Genesis 1, God looks at his creation and he really sees nothing that bears his image up until day six. Nothing that has his likeness. And so God says, let's make one work of creation whose purpose is to be my image, to be my likeness. And I'm going to create a creature that has a special capacity to be like me, to bear my image, to mirror and to reflect my glory, to display my character to the rest of creation. And to give it dominion over everything else, like Miss Marguerite said earlier, to subdue my creation so that all other things, all other creatures in this world will be subordinate to this one thing who is my image bearer. And so God creates us in his image and in his likeness. And as we've talked about, reflection and representation is at the heart of being made in the image of God. And when people think of us, they're supposed to think of God. God wanted his people to be consumed with him and his purposes. That when people look at us, they get a better glimpse into who God is. They get a better glimpse into God's love. They get a better glimpse into his purposes, into his character. Images represent something. We've already established that. And humans made in God's image are created to represent him. This is our divine purpose. Secondly, as Ms. Marguerite said earlier, uh, we rule on behalf of God. Look at one specific ways man was to reflect God. We see in chapter 1, in verse 26 and 28, three times this idea of exercising dominion is emphasized. 
mankind is to exercise dominion over the animals and the earth. It describes that he's supposed to subdue the earth. So one of the aspects of being made in the image of God is that we were created specifically to rule his creation. God gives his image bearers, his little icons, reign and authority over all of his creation. And we have certainly subdued some aspects of creation. We can fly all the way to the moon. That's probably one of the biggest things that have been subdued. The idea of gravity. We can send somebody from Earth to the moon. Or did we? No. Um, but sending somebody to the moon suggests that we have been able to subdue some portion, so to speak, of his creation. We can tame a wild horse. We can tame wild animals. We can put them in a zoo. Go, go to a zoo and think, oh man, we have really subdued that fill in the blank. We've been able to do that. But it's only because of God giving us that authority as the creator. You see this idea in Psalm 8. You can see it on the screen there. When David is speaking about the authority given to man in Psalm 8, in verse 6, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever pass, passes along the paths of the seas. We have a unique position of honor and authority that comes specifically because we are the only part of creation that is made in the image of the Creator. Any comments or questions off that? Seems kind of basic. Um, next, we can relate to God. Humans can know God in ways that no other creation can. There is no aspect of this physical realm that can know God relationally like we can. For example, a den of wolves can't go over and talk about how great and majestic God is. But we can. Wolves can't really go and, and talk about how much they love their, their wife wolf. Correct? They don't do that. They don't build relationships like we can. They can't know the love of God in the same way we can. Look back in Psalm 8. Uh, when David is, is considering his place in, in the hierarchy of creation. In Psalm 8, and verse 3, he says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Perhaps David is looking up in the sky, uh, in the field as a shepherd boy or on the battlefield at night by himself alone and he sees the sky he sees the sun the moon and the stars and he just can't help himself but think wow that is great but what you have done in me made me an image bearer of God you're mindful of me and you care for me way more than these moon stars and everything that's around me. He can't believe it. I can't believe it. You look at all these amazing things in our creation and you cannot believe that you are greater than that. Go to the Grand Canyon. Go to all these amazing things that God has created and you are greater than that. That's incredible that God has done that for us. No one, not the state, not any philosophy, not any social movement, can give humanity more dignity and worth than God can. Our value and worth does not come from ourselves. It is God-given. Amen. Amen to that point. Comments or questions? I'm talking a lot. I got a sore throat. Okay, I guess I'll keep talking. 
um, defaced images of God. We understand why we were created. To be image bearers of God. To represent God. To reflect God. But you know as well as I do, mankind has tragically failed to do this. Adam and Eve could not even exercise dominion, as we described earlier, over the serpent in the garden. But not just the serpent, they were unable to tame the beast that was in themselves. They're banished from the garden. The image of God is completely defaced. And in the history of mankind, things got so bad that in one of the most tragic verses in all of the Bible, says God needs a redo. redo. He was sorry that he made man. In Genesis 6, it says the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. It's suggesting here that there was a point in human history where mankind had ventured so far from the image of their creator that there was nothing left of God in them. Every square inch of them was only on evil continually. They weren't representing God even by accident. It had become so bad that God is even sorry that he made man in the first place. His image has completely been defaced. Imagine for a second, someone goes into the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Who's been there? Raise your hand. I've never been there. Never been there. Um, and Van Gogh's painting, Starry Night, really famous painting. Raise your hand if you know that painting. Yeah, okay. Um, very famous painting is in there, and a vandal goes in there, and graffitis all over, all over the canvas. That would be shocking. That would just be, just blow people's brains if that happened. He grabs a box cutter and cuts up, open that canvas and cuts it all to pieces and he leaves that painting somewhat recognizable. But there's no resemblance to the original. The glory of the original has completely been stripped away. Now keep that in mind when we think about Romans 3, verse 23, where it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all. All means you and I. Think about what the implications are that Paul is saying here in Romans. Every single being that God has created that had the ability to actually know him and love him have turned their backs on him and have defaced the original image he created. We have fallen short of the glory of God, the image of God. Our sin has ruined the image of God. We're that masterpiece in that museum with graffiti all over it with box cutter cuts all over it. There's a resemblance to the original, but we have failed at being what we were created to be. That's a pretty sad state of affairs, if it all ended there. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it doesn't end there. Thankfully, God restores his image. God has not left us as these defaced paintings. Uh, God's solution to fix our failures is that he was going to take on the image of man himself. He was going to come down as a man and show us how to be the perfect image of God. God redeems his image bearers by sending his son to be the perfect image bearer. And Jesus reconstructs us back to our original purpose. You see that in Colossians 1 and verse 15. It says, 
that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the icon, the representation. Everything is in Jesus. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that Christ is the radiance of the glory of God, which we have all fallen short of, by the way, and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the image of God. He perfectly reflects God's glory. Jesus perfectly did what we failed to do. And God's full character and glory dwelled in Jesus. So when you see Jesus, you see who does it say in the Bible? In John? Yeah, you see the Father. Absolutely. So he succeeded to live out the purpose of mankind. He perfectly reflected God. And Jesus ruled as a human ought to. You kind of see that in all of his miracles, correct? He's able to calm chaos, right? He's able to feed people who are hungry. He's ruling over and exercising dominion over creation, just like man should have at the beginning. But look at Colossians 2 in verse 9 and 10. It says, For in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Jesus is the perfect imager of God. And it says that we're being filled in him. What does that mean? I think among other things, it means that in Christ we're being filled continually with God's character. He's filling us with love and patience and godly power, just like Brian mentioned earlier. It means that, like in Colossians 3 later on, he talks about how we're putting to death anger and malice and things that are evil. And in Christ, we're being filled with what we were always supposed to be. Romans 8, 29 states it similarly. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is God's great restoration project. Each and every one of us fit that. He's putting us back together. He's picking up the pieces. He's putting glue and making another image. He's wiping the graffiti away off the canvas. He's cleaning off the icon so it will better recognize him and, and reflect him. Finally, we are called to walk like him. Jesus serves as our model and our guide. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 21 says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. If we want to look like him, we have to walk as he walked. And each step forward as we continue to move towards being that image bearer, it says in Colossians 3.10, we're putting on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge or knowing who God is and knowing who Jesus is as the person of God after the image of its creator. So who should I be? What is my purpose? We must look to the person of Christ for that answer. I kind of finish up the class with this quote. Yes, the will of God is the narrow path for those who walk it. But we need not wonder aimlessly as those with no sense of where his will would have us place our next step. In danger of straying off a cliff, we simply walk in the steps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Any comments, questions off that? Been talking a lot, yeah. So the word all that you use several times, mm -hmm. uh, where we mess up his creation or the perfect painting is when we don't do what Proverbs 3, 5 says. Yeah. It's trust in the Lord with all your mm -hmm. heart and lean not on your own understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Because when we don't acknowledge him and trust in him, that's where things start going south. Yeah, or, or we, 
we define ourselves or we identify ourselves, like I talked about earlier, with our flaws or with our sins or something that we did in the past. In Christ, that's, it's gone. It's taken care of. He's been able to, to recreate the masterpiece that he did at the beginning. All right, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have bestowed so much on us through your created uh, work. God, as we study the next couple weeks, help us to understand that we are reflections and representations of your character. Help us to see you more accurately so we can see ourselves more accurately. Help us to conform ourselves to the image of your son who perfectly came down to earth and lived as your image bearer. Help us to understand that there's not that um, through the knowledge that you are holy, that you're loving, you're good, you're just, you're merciful, you're gracious and faithful, that it can change the way that I live and change the way that we live. God, please be with us. Help us as we worship today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.